Welcome to Look, Look and Look Again. We are providing no greedy corporation has insisted one of our episodes is taken down at episode 10. Right, follow that. Well, anyway, we've had a look at a uh, few movies, so let's venture back to 69, my favourite number, and look at a little-known televisual gem I'm proud to review just for you on Look, Look and Look Again, a bit of drama. The first colour drama, to be honest, and those who looked at my first episode know what it is. So, today, on Look, Look and Look Again, it's... Down to London town, watch the people there, rushing round and round with no time to spare. Look around the sun, one child, a lot of living in you can, if you're strong, can go wrong. Nineteen sixty nine saw the end of a decade. What was the summer of love had now drew to an end. As in episode one we saw that colour played a huge part in the evolution of the UK's TV output in programmes as polychromatic alchemy ensured a vibrant glory flooded into the living rooms all across the nation. So with this in mind and these changing times that saw the decade shake off the dull 50s, then what better way to reflect this time than for the BBC to bring us the very first colour television drama called Take Three Girls, which ran from 1969 to 1971. Come down to London town, watch the people there, rushing round and round with no time to spare. Take Three Girls, a new series of 12 plays in colour begins tonight. Kate is played by Susan Jameson. Angela Durham plays Avril. And Victoria is played by Eliza Goddard. Three young girls from different backgrounds and different circumstances coming together in London to start a new life for themselves, but not without a struggle and second thoughts. Take Three Girls, tonight at 9.10 in colour. Surprisingly, Take Three Girls is a little-known nugget of retro television from the United Kingdom that I think deserves a little bit more kudos. However, that uh, as with when we looked at Out of the Unknown and Ace of Wands, the scarcity of the episodes in the archives um, probably ensure that uh, this really goes under the radar. Take Three Girls was from a time when the BBC actually gave a hoot about the viewer and wasn't chasing ratings, producing shit and paying themselves hyperinflated salaries. This was a time when the series and the BBC's output was produced by people with a passion for writing, production and acting, with the emphasis on quality for the viewer. A time where money and fame played second fiddle 
and uh, the curse of reality television hadn't taken a hold and it was also at a time where quality rather than quantity was paramount and there was significantly less um, paranoia about what other broadcasters were doing. Although Take Three Girls is void of the science fiction horror and downright bizarre that we uh, have been looking at here on Look, Look and Look Again, it is a decent enough um, rare gem that I feel it's necessary to share with you. Why I have decided to do this, I am unsure, but uh, judging by the lack and displacement of information online about Take Three Girls, and quite frankly, as it is so bloody good, I thought I would do it justice here. Um, now, with regards, as I said, about when I reviewed Eight of Wands, if any of you have memories or recollections of the show, uh, should you remember it, please feel free to comment um, below. And also don't forget to hit the like button. So for those of you waiting for more salacious offerings and uh, more cult and more sort of science fiction and horror, you'll be pleased to know there'll be plenty um, for you later on. Um, I'll in further indulge you with some more Russian science fiction and other darker morsels. So don't despair. The arterial aura of Look, Look and Look Again hasn't faded. It is in fact quite warming up. So back to the program in hand. Um, I first chanced upon Take Three Girls whilst watching a retrospective clip program on Channel 4. I recall it being part of their, um, I think it was called TV Heaven, which was a series looking at, and it was looking at cult and retro programs like the Avengers, etc, etc. And it just featured the opening credits of Take Three Girls. And I thought at the time, this to be a real treat as I was completely unaware of what Take Three Girls was all about and wondered uh, if the show was as justifiably swinging as its opening credits. The show was also set at the fag end of the 60s, heralding a new decade. So this was a period of transition I've always found to be interesting um, as a time culturally. So it was a delight for me that a programme existed that could highlight this period in time. Even by the opening credits alone, I knew that a certain air of freedom and emancipation was on offer, as in the credits, the three stunning, um, stunning women, especially Kate, um, what a stunning looking woman Susan Jameson was, um, uh, our three protagonists wander around London with obviously stories to tell about their backgrounds. And to this, the music track, um, as such images flash before us, are complemented by one of the definitive folk hippie tracks to emerge at the time, namely Light, Fight, Light Flight by the Pentangle. As well as Light Flight enhancing the visuals, this also proved to be the perfect accompaniment in percussion and lyricism. And being a fan of the band anyway, it was a revelation that they had ever scored a soundtrack. It was something that uh, I knew they did. Um, Light Flight was assigned to Take Three Girls, but I really didn't sort of, I was, I, I love the track anyway, but I didn't know it was so synonymous with a TV program. And I was pleased to find when I reviewed the episodes that one can get hold of that their music is not confined just to the credits either. I'm pleased to report it was also used throughout the show. The theme, as you've heard, is infectious and it will be swimming around your head for days after you have been warmed. So on the basis of this, not only did I sense this could be a gem on the drama front, but uh, seemingly its appeal was in its apparent element of cute cheek. For example, if we look at the opening credits, check out um, Avril's little skip at the very beginning of the credits and uh, Liza Goddard's twitchy nosed expressions just from the opening titles and uh, before any actor had uttered a word, I desired to know more about the programme. Could a programme promise so much in the way of nostalgia and the uh, now from just the charm and kookiness of the opening credits? Well, 
After all this time, I managed to obtain three episodes from the first series, introducing Kate and Avril and the further escapades of Kate when she goes up to Scotland, and an episode from the second series featuring um, Lully. Um, after viewing these, I can confirm the answer to this is a resounding yes. Uh, being the first UK drama to be broadcast in colour, I would imagine this series would have had a little more attention and ambition than usual, though it is most unfortunate that I have very little in the way of background resource. Take Three Girls was devised by Gerald Savory and produced by Michael Hayes, both coming with a CV of top-rate quality programming. It is also revelatory that resources indicate that Verity Lambert had a hand in the programme's production. Take Three Girls eventually commenced broadcasting on a Monday night at ten past nine on BBC One in November 1969. Imagine having this, Doomwatch, Ace of Wands and John Pertwee's season seven, one of the best seasons in Hoodum, to look forward to. What a choice. No wonder this is referred to as the golden age of television. Take Three Girls had a anthology feel and was about, as you've probably established by now, three girls from um, three varied backgrounds who share a flat. Throughout its tenure, individual episodes focus predominantly on one of the main characters. Behind this is a subtle weave where the protagonists interact and look out for each other. Take Three Girls was a programme of dreams and battles as each character went through the ups and downs against the backdrop of a changing London, where at this time the capital city seemed to have a slight swing, but fluxed from this to a little bit of a limbo. This must have been a fascinating time as it was uh, changing from the cultural zeitgeist it had just been, and at this stage was looking for a brand new direction to welcome in the new decade. But which way? The three original flat sharers were Kate, a single mother, whom is slightly scatty, prone to daydreaming, and has a propensity to slip into a character from her mind's eye when faced with adversity. Kate has her mind fully planted on becoming a famous actress and finding the ideal man to take on her and her baby. Avril was trapped by the stranglehold of her mother's constant overbear and ignorance preventing her to flee the nest at home without conflict. Despite earning a decent wage in a typing pool, she aspires of being an artist. She is also highly dissatisfied with her job. Her introductory story uh, begins with Avril being late for her mundane routine due to her losing total track of time in an art gallery where she often spends her lunch break. So in a way, the majority can identify with our Avril irrespective of gender, doing what we have to do for independence rather than what we want to do. Some things never change, do they? The third character um, is Victoria. A la -di da of some intellect with a strong sense of logic, but this is balanced with naivety at the same time. Victoria aspires to be a famous cellist. I know little of the last character as the story was the third episode which I didn't have to view. Not only this, but it is also one of the several missing episodes, a casualty of the BBC's shameful purge of archive material. The first series weathered much better than the second series. Please check out at the end of this the archive references um, to see what exists and what does not. Going back to Victoria, one can only surmise how this character develops, but from the episodes I have seen the dynamics are perfect for decent drama to unfold. Take Three Girls is not 100% straight drama, despite its gritty elements. It is alleviated by the tendency to sway towards comedy. At times, from what I witness, this strays very close to an almost farcical territory. This can be witnessed in the opening story where Kate auditions for a lecherous producer for the part of a French waitress. 
They call it the method. Yes, I have heard of it. See you, Tess. Good luck. Come in. Oh, come in, Kate. Let's do the bit on page 43, shall we? Oh, you can, uh, you can take that off for a start. <laughs> yeah. Now sit down, will you? Mm, now, you remember, there's a revolution on. I'll be this fellow Dacroix, or whatever his name is. Very nasty piece of work, too, if you ask me. Don't you think? I mean, <laughs> treating those serving girls as if there were so many Fanny Hills. <laughs> those was the good old days, that it was. Come on, then. Nobody asked me, sir, she said. I am sir, but remember, it is to sir with love, you see, underneath. All right? Now we've got this goblet here. Here's a goblet. Here's a carafe. This is the goblet. This is a carafe. This is the table. I'm D'Artois, and you are Chantal. The chambermaid, and don't forget these French are very lecherous and passionate people. All right, come on, Chantal. Then she's uh, she's working, you see. And remember, she gets the the golden goblet. Count will permit me. So that Angus O'Neill didn't know what it was all about, did he? Didn't know how to start, did he? Are you not surprised, are you, Kate? You come in here with a plastic mat, you can't be surprised, can you? Uh, Mr. How about you and me, Kate? Eh? Oh, oh, Monsieur, je t'adore, mais are you still acting? What do you want me to do? What, what do you want me to say? I want to act. I want to do it right. Oh, Monsieur, please tell me. Just tell me. I want to do it right. You better put on your kinky coat and go home to Mum. Sharp. I'm sorry. I'm all right now. We could do it again. Don't bother, Kate. Don't bother. And somebody told me you had what it takes. <laughs> Cheer up, though. The camp is big. There's bags of room for you in the camp, I expect. Take any door you come to. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sorry. There's a word for your sort. Is there? There isn't one for yours. Not one. Well. Nothing. I'm surprised. Just tell me, is he typical? No. But I am. Hmm, some things never change, whether 1970 or uh, 2018. Um, such scenes like this are brought to fruition by some of the larger than life supporting characters. Excuse me for interrupting, but if you hear gurgles, I'm doing the washing as I'm uh, doing this vlog to you, so you'll probably hear that. And it's just to make sure that you realise it's not my stomach. So anyway, yeah, such scenes are brought to fruition by some of the larger-than-life supporting characters and Take Three Girls had plenty of a fine calibre, including some well-known faces such as uh, Stephanie Cole and Anna Cropper, to name but a few. A young Peter Bowles is excellent as the character Jeremy Mandel Fry, where in the first episode Jeremy fawns after Kate, although she isn't the slightest bit interested, and he has a tendency to get completely carried away to almost a small frenzy whenever passionate about a certain idea or person. This, though, is well handled and not off-putting. Such scenes do not seem out of place amongst the dramatic ups and downs, and that is because it is played so well, therefore the comical touches are perfectly balanced. 
There are many characters like this bringing more colour to the series which seemingly accompany the bold mustard and pesto paisley designs and lurid turquoises on display in cloth and decor which managed to shriek out to us from the television screen. The great thing about television of this era was that such trends, designs and interior certainly complemented the new era of colour broadcasting and certainly milked it for every possible hue albeit lurid. Yes, how, how did it go? You haven't told us anything. They're going to let me know. Um, when you attend these things, do you say who you are? I do say I am the daughter of Telly Bell. No. Time was it might have helped you. Not now. Labunta Annie, posthume, posthume. What's this? Whether my father's a failure or not. Yes, but, but, but what happened? I mean, what does happen on these occasions? Uh, did you have to spout to someone? How did it go, Kate? Uh, and either he liked it or he didn't. Uh, he must have liked you. Ah, uh, I read an article in a woman's mag on how girls should look when they apply for various kinds of job. Solicitations of bosses and uh, bossesses, the miniskirt traffic. Uh, now, if you applied for the job that we're advertising, general aid, I'd leap at you. Do you give preference to unmarried mothers who can't do anything? Yes, 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 like fun we do, better and better. Isn't that our great tradition? Mary, unmarried, mother of God, begotten most certainly of man, of goods man, or or Angus man, or God man, all the same, then you with a near. That's what we need, courage, resource. Why, even I can type fast enough for our purposes, and a week, a week, a, a month, you too will type like the wind. Why not, Katie? It only took me six months. Pim, darling, I mean, can you or can't you? Why not take him like this? She's not right. What do you mean? She doesn't look worried. She looks glassy. Well, she is glassy. She's made me glassy. It's seven o'clock. They won't take a glassy mother and a thin baby. Right. Wrap it up, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Elias. Thanks, all. Same time Monday? Oh, I don't think so, love. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, love. He's retired. Home for old actors. Why? Well, he said try Oxfam or something. Well, you know, Mr. Emery, just kidding. Titanius. Covering the topics of the day, Take Three Girls must have been quite taboo for some of the audience at the time. Although we like to think of this country as completely liberalised in the halcyon days of the 60s and 70s, for many it wasn't. In a brave attempt, the show covered eyebrow raises such as single motherhood, class, sex, politics and interracial relationships. Some of the episodes were written by the prestigious playwright Hugo Charteris and the talents of Charlotte Bingham and Terence Brady were also employed, mainly for the stories featuring Victoria. It was of no surprise the latter writers went on to write some sterling drama for the definitive in period drama Upstairs Downstairs. The stories work on so many levels, reflecting the talents of the writer, as with every piece of quality drama, there is always an element of pathos or mild schadenfreude and plots focusing heavily on transformation and genesis. The three girls meeting the world begin to change on many scales in front of the spectator. Another thing worth mentioning from the episodes I viewed were the beautifully crafted scenes of warmth, which are in themselves very warm and very moving. Once again, these are excellently written and perfectly played. A noticeable selection of scenes involves a relationship between Kate and her friend Simon, the blind man who lives in the bottom flat. There are some beautifully executed exchanges of dialogue between the two characters, and despite his handicap, Simon seems to be aware of all that is going on and seems to be the one who genuinely uh, cares for Kate 
and her illegitimate son, Aeneas. The rapport between both is really, really lovely as both look out for each other and there is a genuine affection, more romantically so on Simon's side than Kate's, but the boundaries are apparent and made clear as Kate courteously infers. I guess this is, I guess this is refreshing to see because the majority of men Kate meets throughout her introductory story are such leches and really only want Kate out of desire. But with regards to Simon, the affinity between them is an entirely different realm altogether. It's terribly sweet and genteel, but without wanting to make you vomit, you can certainly tell this series isn't American. Uh, goodbye. Hey, Elia. Dear Princess. You can have half back. Oh, you make everything so flipping complicated. Pay me later. No, take ten shillings. Certainly not. Now, have you let the rooms yet? Yes, both. Good, that's better. And you're not coming to the church? To see your beloved father, Telly Bell, starring in a christening? Certainly not. Simon? Oh, my dear Kate, I do adore you, but I've got pupils all day long. Bye, must fly. <laughs> What was your lecture like? Oh, ecstatic. There were cries of bravo and stamping of feet. By the way, Kate, when I came home, your telephone was ringing. Uh, alas, I was too late, though. Oh. I thought perhaps it might have been Victoria. You know, you never told me what colour her hair was. Wheat, with opal eyes. And Avril? Mouse, but slender as a wand. Oh, dear Kate, your troubles are over. You're a landlady. Ten pounds a week steady. I want a decent job. I wish I'd gone to university. A decent job and a degree are probably two things that don't go together. <laughs> but seriously, Kate, what about the career now? Do you mean the stage? Yes, the stage. Acting. I shall go on acting. I know I can. But, for the moment, not upon the stage. Oh, the stage will miss you, dearest Kate. I shan't be going to the theatre now as often as I did. One day I shall find a part, think this is me. Opposite a splendid leading man, my dear. I had a leading man, but he was miscast. Darling Kate, the casting agency that enrolled Angus O'Neill as a husband would soon be out of business. Would it? I cast you as a friend. And so I am. Another sequence of well-executed poignancy are the scenes at the ending of the first episode where Kate identifies herself and her son Aeneas with an iconic picture from a calendar. It's iconic in two ways as it symbolises the sanctity of motherhood which Kate had lost and now finds. There is also the significance of tearing away the past to a starting point from where she can move on when she rips out the old months and brings things up to date for the arrival of her new flatmates. I felt this to be an exceptional piece of writing and acting, something of which has been off our screens for such a long time. Oh, and the pace that graceful, eloquent pace where you can really be enveloped in plot without the twisting and twirling of a cameraman on amphetamine or music filling every bloody scene to patronizingly tell its audience what they should be feeling. These missing elements, symptomatic to our modern times, are something I really don't miss at all when viewing programmes from the past. Such scenes should be applauded for all it's worth with regard 
to the skills of the artists who are performing, the writer who wrote the story, and the director making a valued combination of bringing something so worthwhile as I have witnessed when watching the episodes that I've seen from Take Three Girls. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, I've got a job, full time as a secretary. Oh. Only I could get a job as secretary to the boss without having first done secretarial training. <laughs> oh well, never mind. I've got to go. All right. Shall I leave this? No, keep it. When are you going to move in? I don't know. I'll let you know. Keep it. Tender moments can also be seen in Avril's tale, which uh, leads quite nicely on from the sequence where she receives the key in the first episode. It's a story called Avril, Deb and Violets, where after a bitter parental showdown, her mother finally swallows her pride and bids her daughter farewell at the bus stop with a gift from her own past. This offers a neat twist of conclusion. Um, other skillfully played sequences are Avril's only bit of harmony in the household of that with her father. Both, it seems, are victims of her mother's bullying as a result of her mother's own inadequacy, pride, fear, and the fear of change. The show is positively littered with these touches of warmth and uh, character dynamics and if you look hard enough you can find yourself being amply rewarded. Even from the episodes I viewed we automatically care for the characters from the very get-go and this would have been a fascinating journey throughout its 12 episode run of the first season. I'm certain of that. I'm off now, Barry. Holiday. What's that? Your Devon Violet. How long since you've given me? How long? Five years this Christmas, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Five years. For your holiday, you said. Well, it was a joke, like. Joke? My holiday, a joke? Well, no, love. Five years. I remember, because our average was just 13. Five years. Talk, all talk, that's you. Should have known when I married you. In another five years, it would be disintegrated. Talk, all talk. You did all the talking. <laughs> Yeah. You had a lovely voice, Nora. That's right. All soft and cooing like a pigeon. I loved your voice. Why don't you use it? Use it? Yeah. Make you smell nice. It's meant to be used. In that kitchen? Well, when you have your bath. In here. Oh, I couldn't use it like that, Barry. No, I couldn't.
Have you got the time, please? Five minutes to one, dear. Oh, well. to wash, won't you? In that bathroom of yours. You'll need to wash. Later, the <clears throat> second series of Take Three Girls began another 12 episode duration. Although the characters had changed, whether for the better or worse, I cannot say, because of the lack of viewing materials, we gather that Kate went off and got married and Avril went to work at an art gallery in Paris. This left Victoria with two new flatmates. A seemingly opinionated, emancipated American called Lully, who is studying psychology, and a character called Jenny, who is a journalist. There again, I am short on words here, as I viewed one episode from the second series, which really wasn't all that good in comparison to the first three that I saw from season one. Where I couldn't help but like the characters from season one, I found Lully to be too far up her own ass to be likeable, and she did come over as a bit of a bore, although it was rather good to see her denouement at the end of the episode. Come down to London town, watch the people there, rushing round and round with no time to spare, over on the someone trod Take it from me when I say that it is a huge shame that only a number of um, episodes exist from Take Three Girls in the Archives and it would be very doubtful if any are released on DVD as I doubt the show would not be a big enough cash cow for the BBC to contemplate a release for them. Um, however, we can only hope that a gem like this may get the repeat it deserves. It's also rather annoying that the BBC and other um, whether it's the independent television network, for example, don't open up their archives and charge a pay-per-view sort of system. So um, fans like myself of retro television couldn't access them legitimately. There's such a large hiatus and a load of flap about um, downloading illegally and obtaining um, things via the grey market. Um, whereas I thought, or I think that if they were to release 
episodes like this online and people would not look at alternative sources to procure or to get these episodes it is a shame um i just hope that basically you know that maybe bbc4 might be able to do a retrospective and screen them but if they do make sure you pull up a seat for a bit of tv heaven which proves that the golden age of television was never a matter of opinion but clearly if take three girls is anything to go by a matter of fact